It was, so it was wonderful for us to have Carolyn come to visit. She wrote a wonderful report, which you can have access to, about what we do. Um, and then it's resulted in me being able to come and talk with you today, which is really a pleasure. And I particularly appreciate that you've come inside into a windowless room when it is 25 degrees outside and gorgeous. So you'll just have to be gorgeous in here, OK? So I'm not going to talk today about the whole program at the Champion Centre. I'm not going to talk about our multidisciplinary um, approach to children with high needs, but I'm happy to talk about that aspect afterwards or in question time if you like. What I want to focus on today, um, because that's what Carolyn asked me to talk about, is actually our work with children born prematurely. Um, and I'm aware that you come from a variety of different backgrounds. I've been told we've got health people and education people and so forth here. So I've tried to structure this talk in a way that covers those bases, but of course it does mean that for some of you it'll be old hat, um, and for others of you it'll be new. So hopefully you'll each get something out of it, um, even if I'm telling you things that you already know. What I'd like to do is to review a little bit about um, prematurity, what it, what, it, what it is, what it means, um, and I particularly want you to go away thinking about the impact throughout life, actually, on the parent of the child being born prematurely as well as on the infant. It's that relationship-based approach that is so enormously important and doesn't go away for the parent. Um, the child may be able to forget about it from time to time, but the parent certainly doesn't. Um, so, if you go away with nothing else but a renewed respect for the parents of children born prematurely, I will have succeeded. You'll see that I've put all my colleagues up there, or some of my colleagues. The, the ones I've listed are the ones who are involved in our assessment and monitoring for prematurity program, which I will talk about sort of in the second half of what I'm going to say um, today. I want to start, though, by showing you a bit of videotape that was made for us by a parent. Now, how many people in the room are mothers or fathers? Okay. Some of you will have had a challenging birth, I'm guessing, uh, one or more times. You may find what I'm going to show you distressing. I find it distressing, and I didn't have difficult births. So if I turn away, it's because I'm choking up. Um, so don't be afraid if this brings back memories that you thought you had forgotten. But I think it is a very powerful statement by a parent of what the beginnings were like for their child. I'll tell you, though, this child came through well. She's now in her teens. And she is... She is, as I say, doing well. But this is... So for the, all of you who had, were handed your babies as soon as they were born and smelled them and held them, that's not what happened. So you can see that that's not an experience that any parent is going to forget. That's going to be with that mother and that father for the rest of their lives. And that's what I want to, to you to be aware of as you think through um, what the long-term consequences are. So let's talk a bit about the sort of facts and figures of prematurity. Um, gestational age is actually what defines prematurity, of course. Um, full term is 40 weeks, so less than that um, becomes increasingly premature. But it's not always easy to determine exact gestational age. So quite often in the literature you'll see that actually it's birth weight that is used as a proxy for prematurity. Um, which is reasonable in many cases, but not in all cases. So children who are small for gestational age, for example, obviously the birth weight is not the best um, guide. And really both birth weight and um, gestational age are both risk factors. So it's, it's a risk factor to be small for your gestational age as much as it is to be um, born prematurely. There are um, people talk in terms of degrees of prematurity. So it, um, Extremely preterm, are they under, often under 25 or under 26 weeks? Um, in New Zealand, we actually have quite a number of 23-weekers. Um, but I gather in England, is it 
people are saying to me, sort of 24 is the limit to viability, but we certainly got 23, maybe 23 plus two or three days, which can make a huge difference. Very preterm, generally speaking, is 26 to 33 weeks. 34 to 36 would be late preterm, and over 36 weeks, we kind of think, well, it's practically full term. Um, and very low birth weight, under 1,500 grams, extremely low birth weight, under 1,000. So that little girl was 790 grams, so she was obviously extremely low birth weight. She was born at 23 weeks. There are multiple causes um, of prematurity, some of which we don't understand, um, others of which we, we um, do understand. Um, fertility strict treatments um, often result in premature birth, either because the mother's carrying ability actually isn't, I mean, that's the little reason why she didn't um, conceive naturally, and that's impacted on um, post-IVF. IVF often results in multiple births, and multiple births also tend to um, be premature because there's a lot more in there that doesn't want to stay in. Um, other things such as smoking, substance abuse, um, rural living, and certainly in New Zealand, you get mothers who are out in the wop wops and they um, can't get to the hospital quickly enough and they're going over un, um, unpaved roads and that sort of thing. Um, it's very much connected to poverty. In my country at the moment, I was born here, by the way, but my country now is New Zealand. Um, there are cultural influences both on poverty and on prematurity. In New Zealand, um, Māori, for example, the indigenous people of New Zealand, more likely to have uh, premature infants. Um, and then in other cultures, um, sometimes attitudes towards pregnancy mean there might not be such good care um, and... Um, can result in, in unhealthy mothers and prenatal um, preterm birth. So there are a large, large number of factors, but we don't actually understand the biology of prematurity terribly well yet. There's lots of things we don't understand about what triggers it, and, and that doesn't help either. There are a large number of premature births, and in, of course many more surviving premature births than would have survived, say, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. And as a parent, you're never going to say, let them go. Um, as a medical system, sometimes, some places do. In Holland, I believe, there is a do not resuscitate below a certain age. Um, I don't imagine, can't imagine what that must be like for the parent. But uh, my searching on the web suggests that the number of um, premature births in the UK is about the same proportion as it is in a place like New Zealand. It may well be different in, in other countries. But if you think about uh, the number of classrooms there are, the chances are that every classroom in England or in the UK will have at least one child born uh, prematurely and probably more like two or three, to be honest. I haven't got anything to, to change this other than this, have I? No, it's all right. I'll do it. So... Prematurity is a developmental risk to the child. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'll talk a little bit also about um, the risk to the parent. Um, the there is major impact on development in about 10% of cases of prematurity, extremely premature, pre um, very premature, uh, or late premature. But obviously, the, well, not obviously, but in fact, the, the earlier born, the more likely there is to be a significant impact although there are things that we don't really understand yet about, as I say, about the biology of prematurity um, and sometimes quite late prem premature infants have significant difficulties. And probably it's because if the, ter the pregnancy is terminated suddenly at a period of developmental growth, whatever that is, it could be eyes, could be ears, could be lungs, could be whatever, then there's likely to be an impact on that system that is in flux at that moment. So some of the later born children may be in better shape in some aspects of their development, but not in such good shape in terms of others. Kinds of things that can occur are around, in terms of medical fragility, um, are respiratory. Um, asthma is extremely common amongst children born prematurely. Um, 
and chronic lung disease. Um, brain damage is probably the one that most people worry about because of course that impacts all areas of development depending on where the damage is and I'll come back to that. Um, vision uh, is, is a fragile part of the medical um, presentation of a child born prematurely. We are better than we were, at least we are in New Zealand, I assume you are in, in the UK. There was a time when the hearing and the vision of children born prematurely was being damaged further by the very machines that were there to keep them alive because they were too loud and it was too bright. We are much better at, at um, neonatal care. I'd be interested to know what some of you neonatal nurses think of what you just saw in the video because I think there's probably some handling um, lessons to be learned with that arm flailing around. I wasn't so keen on that. Um, but that's ch that was 15 years ago that, that that video was taken. So things are always developing. I do like to say, though, that I think that if women were in charge of the world, we would have got quite a lot further down the track of having a much more sophisticated external womb machinery that would be... Um, I said that to a neonatal um, paediatrician not too long ago, and she, she poo-pooed the idea. She said, oh, no, you've got to have this, that, and the other thing. But I just have this feeling that, you know, if we could recreate a womb-like environment um, with technology, we could, we could probably uh, do better. I think we can also do better at keeping babies in there as well. Um, again, you know, I'm sure research will get there eventually, but I was feeling that maybe because, you know, it's women doing women's things, that it doesn't get quite the attention that perhaps it should. Um, the impact of prematurity, and this is the really tricky one, this is why we have the program that we have at the Champion Centre, the impact may not be apparent in infancy. Or, contrary, it may look ghastly at the beginning and then resolve and you end up with a child who has very little, if any, impact. So it's one of those, if you like, conditions that is really hard to read. And so from a provision point of view, you absolutely have to prepare for the worst, really. You have to set up the systems so that if the child needs more support, it's there. If they don't need it, great. But you, you, it's hard to pick. Um, with possibly, I mean, if, if a child has an MRI at birth and it really looks bad, you can pretty much predict that there are going to be ongoing issues. But even there sometimes, the MRI can look ghastly and the child's functioning remarkably well. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky set of um, presentations. We have very few preventative tools because we don't actually understand um, the basic biology of what it is that um, triggers premature birth in many cases. The impact on the parent is profound. Um, they feel gypped. They feel done out of the things that you're supposed to have in your last trimester. You're supposed to have a leaving party from work. You're supposed to have a shat baby shower. You're supposed to have the nursery ready. You're supposed to have your spouse or your partner, you know, all, all set up to take time off work from his or her work, whatever. And all of a sudden, you go to work one day and the next day you're not there. Because most premature birth is not forewarned. It just happens um, from one day to the next. And women feel a loss of control. I mean, after all, that's what we, this is one of the things we're supposed to be able to do. The guys can't do it, we can do it, and if we don't get that right, many parents, many mothers feel like, well, what am I? I, I can't even bloom and give birth to a baby. You know, that feeling is, it can be quite profound for, for a mother. And the neonatal intensive care unit, wonderful as neonatal intensive care unit environments can be, is one that is not run by the mother. It is run by somebody else. In fact, it's run by a team of other people. And often you get parents who, when they finally can take their child home after several weeks in, in intensive care, are terrified. How do I parent this child? I haven't been parenting this child for the last X number of weeks. What am I going to do without the nurses? Which leads you to think, if you are a nurse, how much control are you giving to the parent? How are you upskilling the parent to become the parent of that child when they take it home? Being a flash, really good, competent nurse, great. But that doesn't help the parent in that relationship. Parent needs to feel empowered by, by the nurse, not um, excluded by the nurse. 
recognizing that, of course, there are certain procedures that only a nurse or a, or a pediatrician or whatever can do, and the neonatologist can do, but, but it's as parents get to be leaving that environment, they have to have the power handed back to them. So one of the things you saw in that video, of course, was kangaroo care, um, and that's, that's really fantastic. Is that, nor is that done everywhere in, in the UK now? Mm, should be, but isn't quite. Yeah, I suspected that. It's the same in New Zealand. Um, it's all set up, it's all there, but sometimes it's just a bit of a bother to get this child with all their wires and tubes and everything else into this, uh, against this mother or father. But it's such, it's important, hugely important, picking up those body rhythms um, directly from the skin of the parent. And it's something a father can do as well, which is really, really important um, because they can actually hold the child too. Um, many, many parents, of course, are worried that this child's not going to make it. And when they come into uh, an early childhood setting, for example, of a, a nursery school or whatever, you, in the back of the mind is this parent, is a, is a child that we thought wasn't going to be here or we thought one day was, and then the next day they told us to prepare for the worst, and then the next day it was all right again, and then the next day we had to prepare for the worst. So they've had this roller coaster, and suddenly, as an into an education environment, they're being asked to give up control of this child that they have cosseted and they have looked after so carefully through those early years, and you're saying, goodbye, we'll take care of this child. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> as a parent, I'm not ready to do that. So again, if you're in an education environment, you have to think about how you reassure, how you involve, how you engage with the parent so that you understand the journey that they have been on. These, um, the parent has had enormous strains. If, if this is not their first child, they have probably got another child at home, or maybe more, and they've been running back and forth between their home and the hospital, and they're trying to do the very best for the child born prematurely, but in the meantime, their relationships with their, their partner, their relationships with their, par their own parents, their relationship with their other children are under strain. And if you live in an urban area and getting around is difficult, and parking at a hospital is impossible, I mean, all of these kinds of normal stresses and strains are just magnified. It's, it's, it's highly comp complex. We find in New Zealand, I'd love to hear that in the UK it's different, we find that, um, I guess it's, see if, we have Plunkett, but I get Plunkett nurses, but I guess for you it's health visitors, the sort of, you know, the early, early years of, of being measured and weighed and all the rest of it. Are they using premature scales? Are they mo using growth charts that are, that are adjusted for prematurity? They should be. But we find that quite often they're, they're not. And even parents going to a, um, to a group, in, they might have been in hospital with a group of other mothers, and other, they get together afterwards, that often happens, but they don't fit because their baby's too small. The other children are getting bigger, and theirs are still very underdeveloped. So those kinds of relationships are strained as well. So again, it would be good if, if all profession, health professionals working with children born prematurely, A, know that, and sometimes the parents don't tell them they don't know, but then they can adjust their expectations. Because in the early um, years, you have to adjust for the prematurity. It has to be adjusted, um, adjusted age so that it fits their gestational age, not their chronological age, right? So it's, they might be nine months old, but if they were three months early, they're really only six months old. Um, and many parents actually don't know themselves what to expect of early development, particularly if this is their first child. So they may not realise that they're looking at delays and, and even disorders sometimes in, in development as a result of prematurity because they don't actually know what that looks like. This is particularly the case in modern Western societies where there aren't multiple generations living in close proximity and there isn't grandma or auntie who can say, hang on, I've had you know, contact with 15 children between my own and my, my siblings, etc., and this doesn't look quite right to me. So again, it's, it, that can compound the challenges. And then finally, of course, there's um, the impact of trying to find the right kind of 
postnatal care um, in terms of intervention. Um, for, the ch for the child then, there are those medical fragilities, but even just the fact that they are suddenly, it's sudden for the parent, but it's sudden for the child, suddenly they're out in gravity, which they weren't really in because they were in fluid. Um, they've lost the maternal biorhythms. Bio Suddenly they're grounded in a way which the, their bodies and brains were not ready for. Um, they've lost the natural nutrients that they were getting by the placenta. Um, they've lost an intimate relationship and sometimes um, they've lost a sibling in the process of premature birth. When um, Carolyn and I go on tomorrow to Sweden, one of the, two of the International Society of Early Intervention Conference, um, one of my colleagues is going to join me there and we're doing a presentation around um, a couple of, two children, both born very prematurely, who uh, present as if they are on the autistic spectrum. Um, they're not, but you have to unpack the complexity of their early lives in order to understand how their sensory systems and their social emotional systems have been so damaged by the premature birth and a sequen uh, some of the relationship things that have happened beyond that. But in one of, one of these two children was a, one of a twin, a pair of twins, and the stronger one died eight weeks after they were both born. And so this little boy is not only lost his relationship with his mother too early, he's also lost the relationship with someone that he was embedded with, <laughs> literally, um, through, through the pregnancy. So all of, all of those kinds of frig frig fragilities are there. And of course, these, are, these children have very immature um, neurological systems, so they, they, don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily able to coordinate their lungs and their um, voices to call for help. For a start, they've probably got a tube down there, so they can't actually tell you much at all. And so it's hard for everybody to understand what the child is trying to say. Um, so just to kind of, again, just sort of um, recapitulate some of this, just how early we are now able to keep these children alive, if they are born at 23 weeks gestation, um, they, the fat stores are not yet laid down. And so children born prematurely, often they're often very skinny, even when they're 16, um, because those fat stores don't get laid down in the same way after birth. They needed to have been laid down before birth. Um, they often feel the cold. Um, I had a, I'll show you a picture later on of a little girl who's done really well, but I, when I sent the um, request to the mother to be allowed to ask the photo of her daughter for this presentation, um, she said, yes, that's great, and she gave me, I'll put it up on the slide, but she gave me um, a quote about how Jessica is now doing, and she said she's the only one who has to wear a wetsuit in the swimming pool because she was born so prematurely she's got very little fat store, and, and that will be with her for life. Um, the eyes are not fully developed to 23 weeks, um, and neither are, are the lungs. So again, it gives you an idea of just how fragile these children are. Um, to talk a little bit more about um, the, the potential for, for brain damage, this, this is still an ongoing area of very active research, really, because, as I said earlier, sometimes you can see immediately that there are um, problems in terms of, of brain development. But what's harder to see, of, even with you know, high resonance uh, imaging, is small damage that can cascade in its impact. So it might look like very little or not even be visible, in fact, on, on an MRI scan at birth, but over time, that damage can, um, can um, become greater because it, um, is, it, they call it cascading, so it's actually kind of building damage over time. There are things that are done to, um, to try to minimize that. Probably the main one is cooling. Um, and making sure the brain doesn't get overheated. I like this slide because it's, it comes from the research that I was involved in um, at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, but it's, it just reminds us, so the, the, the brain at the top is a full-term control, the brain uh, of a child who was born at full-term. And the one at the bottom is from the study, it's of a child who was born three months premature, 
at the same age. So this is at term, so at 40 weeks, so um, several weeks after the child was actually born. But you can see that this, this brain fills the skull and this one doesn't. There's all this dark here is space. So even though the children are the same age gestationally in those two images, the child born prematurely has still got a brain that is not as large as the full term. And over on the right there, it, those are models, obviously, but it's just to remind us that um, between... The, so the tiniest one is a, is a child born at 23 weeks. The middle one is a child born at full term, and the, the leftmost one is an adult brain. To remind us that the growth from 23 weeks to 40 weeks is almost as, good, as great as the growth from birth to adult. So the amount of brain development that's happening in that last trimester that is the trimester that's missing for these children born so early is enormous. So I've said already that the immature um, neurological systems lead to children whose presentation is difficult for adults to interpret or anybody to interpret um, because they aren't often, for example, if they have immature musculature of their face, they're not able, to, they're often not so able to smile, to respond um, with signals that we as adults are set up biologically to respond to. So sometimes you get parents of, of children who might, who were born prematurely, who might be a year old, and they say, well, you know, he's so withdrawn and he doesn't respond. Well, is he that he doesn't respond or you can't read the signals of that response because he can't control his facial muscles well enough to give you the kind of smiles and feedback that you're expecting. White matter injury is very common. So white matter is the, the axons of the, of the brain cells covered in myelin, which is the fatty um, sheath, because the um, ch children born late in pregnancy, the fat stores are laid down under the skin, but also later um, are the um, laying down the fat stores inside the brain. So there is less myelination, which means there's less um, efficient connections between, between brain cells. Um, I just want to say, I, I can see you, some of you might be trying to take notes frantically or even video. What we are doing, this is being videoed and it will be available and I'm happy to um, make that through, through Carolyn so don't feel like you've got to scribble like mad. Um, the prefrontal cortex, which is the last part of the brain to develop, is, is the most fragile in these children. In full-term full -term infants, it is the least developed. It's not developed. In fact, it doesn't finish developing until we're about 25 years old. So if you have teenagers and you wonder why they're you know, still doing stupid things, it's because their prefrontal cortex hasn't developed yet. Um, but this is particularly fragile in children born prematurely and it has a huge effect on their ability, particularly in school, to manage themselves, to self-regulate and be um, able to learn uh, effectively in school. So I just want now, that's sort of a, a, um, a quick tour of prematurity per se from a from more of a medical point of view. And what I want to do now is to talk about um, some of the lifelong impacts of prematurity, but with a focus on early childhood because that's what we work with and what my expertise is in. And probably the most important thing to understand is about regulation, physiological regulation, emotional regulation, self-regulation. Samaroff basically says that there are sort of four, if you like, four stages. Um, being, being regulated means it means to be on an even keel, if you like, right? It means to be able to be calm and alert. And that's the state that we all have to be in if we're going to learn anything or if we're going to manage our lives at all. If we're completely stressed out and, and you know, brains full of cortisol, we're not in any state to do anything. And we need to ensure that these little children who have gone through this pretty horrendous experience because good as neonatal procedures are, they've probably been stuck, stuck many times in their feet and their hands and all of that. So they, they've come into a world that will seem to them fairly 
full on and aggressive and, and pretty painful. So we need to ensure in the way we work with them and we treat them that we're actually um, encouraging a, a good pathway of regulation all the way through to being able to manage their emotions and their behaviour when they're in school. Because if they can't do that, if you're a teacher, you know what that means, that they're, then they are becoming behaviour. No infant is, can be guilty of behaviour because that's, they're not able to make that choice. But we're the ones who call it bad behaviour, certainly. So as a neonate, it's physiological regulation we're looking for. This is where things like singing to a child, um, rocking, um, doing things which actually make sure that their physiological systems are calm. As they get a little bit older, they need to be able to regulate their emotions. So gradually they need to be able to delay gratification, not lose the plot when something doesn't quite go their way. Um, they need, to, as a toddler, to be able to stay focused on something and actually see a task through Otherwise, they don't understand the world, really. Oh, um, and as a preschooler, they need to be able to, as I say, regulate themselves so that they can actually engage with others and manage themselves. So that's sort of a four-step process through, through early childhood. And prematurity can have an impact on all of those. So from very early on, it's really important that parents learn uh, how to ensure physiological regulation as preparation, ultimately, for ensuring self-regulation on the part of the child when they are uh, in school. It's quite a lot of the work of the um, research project at, the, Ch at uh, the University of Canterbury was based around emotional and behavioural regulation. And um, one of the studies, uh, the, the basic study followed almost 100 children born prematurely prematurely. It was a prospective study, so they simply took, um, I think it was every forward and backward one born um, in, within a fixed period uh, at the um, Christchurch Hospital and similarly took um, a group of full-term children um, selected in the same way. And they managed to have very high levels of um, retainment uh, within the study. So there were almost 100 in every aspect of the study, which is, which is great. This particular one looked at um, 95 children, followed from two to four. They observed them um, in parent-child interactions. They were given a, a, a problem-solving toy, and the parent was asked to um, engage with the child. They looked at how the child problem solved, whether or not they persisted with the task when it was difficult. They looked at how the parent scaffolded the child's success at the toy and whether they were intrusive or not or whether they were responsive to the child. And then they also did um, uh, um, hands-on formal testing of the child and parent report around the child's um, capacity to, for example, transition from one activity to another. All of the sorts of things which are actually involved in what's usually called executive function. And the children made gains, but they were always behind their full-term equivalents. So the extremely premature children in this graph here are the bottom solid line. The very premature children are the middle one, and the top one is the full-term control. So you can see changes being made over time, but um, it's, they're still behind. And these are children who's, they're, they're comparing them with adjusted age, so they're not comparing them by chronological age, they're comparing them by gestational age. Um, so they made gains over time, particularly those in the very preterm as opposed to the extremely preterm group. But both groups of premature infants showed poorer frustration control, poorer persistence, um, poorer sustained attention, than the controls. So if you're an educationalist, you'll be, you will be beginning to recognise some of these um, behaviours, I'm sure, in, in children. Not surprisingly, they did better if the parent was responsive and sensitive and gave them space. One of the things that we notice often is that if a child, it might be prematurity, it might be something else, but if a child's reactions are slower, if the parent doesn't wait for the child's reaction, you get a conflict. So if the parent goes, 
Kaboo! And doesn't wait long enough, the, pet, the child may have been going to respond, but if you don't wait, you start going in over the top of them when they, it was their turn. So these sorts of um, engagement, learning, teaching a, a parent how to wait for the child's response is a huge part of what we do um, in the program that I'll talk about in a minute. So just again, to just finish up on the, the dynamic between the infant and the parent, um, reactive, easily distressed infants may be particularly susceptible to this kind of unresponsive or insensitive parenting. Now sometimes that's because the parent themselves is not well. So if a parent doesn't respond, it could be because they themselves have mental health issues. The typical one would be depression. Um, that's not going to help a child learn to be regulated if the parent is either going in over the top of them insensitively or is unresponsive. And poorly regulated mothers, who are themselves poorly regulated, will quite often kind of get in there and try to get things going but again, if they're not paying close attention to the very minute signals that these children are often giving and learning their children really well. There's a really good program, I don't know whether you have it here, called Watch, Wait and Wonder. Is this one that's familiar? That whole, just saying the title, doesn't matter how it's done, but the idea that you watch, you wait, you learn the child, and then you figure out how to engage with them. So what we want is smooth, calm, synchronous parenting. We want parent and child to learn how to engage with each other in a way that is satisfying to both of them, but particularly satisfying to the child. And it is often the parent who has to learn how to do things that feel less comfortable to them in order to achieve that. So you get mutual regulation, both parent and child regulated, when you've got the opportunity for calm, regulated face-to-face -face play, feeding, and other kind of caregiving tasks. So again, with parents, often it's a question of saying, it's not just changing a nappy, actually. This is, a, this is an engagement. This is a moment when you and the child are face-to-face. -face. You can make it a, a moment of engagement and of face-to-face um, -face interaction with calm, clear turn-taking between the two of them. Um, and parents help to regulate the physiological state of the child by timing things so that it matches um, what the child is able to manage. And this has to be done early because if you don't do this, uh, by the time a child is two or three, it's really difficult because you're gonna, in order to do it, you're going to have to take them back to a much earlier stage to lay in these more calm, regulated ways of engaging. So I mentioned executive function, which is something which, if in the schools, it doesn't matter whether it's nursery school or university, to be honest, um, if you haven't got a good executive function capacities, you're going to find it very hard to be part of a learning group and part of um, an educational environment, and, and part of a family, actually. Um, so executive function is characterised by working memory, so children who are born prematurely often have challenges hanging on to the task that is being asked of them. And this is where things like visual supports can come in and make a huge difference. Um, they have difficulty inhibiting their own reactions and actually learning how to manage their emotions. And they often have great difficulty with cognitive flexibility, that is, being able to shift from one idea to another and get get fixated on one idea. This is where some of the ideas that children born prematurely might be more likely to have autistic traits to them can come from. It may not be anything to do with that being autistic. It may be to do with the challenges to executive function that go along with a very poorly developed prefrontal cortex. We use, um, at the Champion Centre, we use the BRIEF, the Behaviour Rating Inventory of Executive Functions, a very short um, parent um, questionnaire but it does help to um, identify some of the um, features of, of these children. And my colleague, Alison Gray, um, has been running this parent questionnaire with the children in the program I'm just about to talk about. Um, and you can see that the children born prematurely at the Champion Centre, they're the red bars. Um, they that's the percentage of children with significant disability, or sorry, significant difficulty 
in, um, in inhibiting their emotions, in shifting from one um, task to another, in controlling their emotions, in remembering what it is they're supposed to be doing so that their working memory is engaged, and in planning and organizing themselves in a task. And you can see immediately that the children born prematurely compared with um, the blue bars are actually the controls from um, the manual for the, for the brief, but it should be clear what the issue is. And at f this is another study from that um, research at the university. At four years, the children born prematurely, both groups, the extremely premature and the very premature, more emotional problems, more conduct problems, more hyperactivity, more peer relationship challenges, and more overall behavioral difficulties. You don't need to worry about the specific numbers, but you can see that um, if, if you have a large number of children with these kinds of challenges in the classroom, this is very challenging. And I had to tell you that you probably know that in Christchurch in 2011 and 2010 and 2011, we had two massive earthquakes. And the children, this was five years ago, so the children who were in utero in 2010 and 2011 are now in going into school and the teachers are reporting a huge increase in these kinds of behaviours in the classroom. These are children who can't calm themselves, can't cooperate with others, who are easily distressed, easily destabilised and one has to assume A, that it's partly the result of the, of the flooding of the mother with cortisol, which is the, a stress hormone, when the, before the children were born. But we, we have had, and counting, 12,000 aftershocks, something like that. We still have them every month or so. Um, and every time they happen of a, s a certain magnitude, I react, everybody reacts, because we've, we've gone through this. Our systems are changed forever, but, and the parents will be reacting, and so will the children. So over five years, some of the children in Christchurch this was a natural disaster, but they're behaving the same way as children who've been through war. Um, and so that's huge. This is a little bit about um, language. How are we doing? I think I'm talking quite a bit. Is that okay? You all right? Okay. Um, this is from a study I, I um, first authored. This is uh, just a graph to show... I've got a couple of slides just to show some of the language impacts on um, children born prematurely. This data is from the two-year-old study where we collected um, vocabulary size using the, what's now called the, Mac the Bates-MacArthur um, Communicative Development Inventory. It provides parents with it's about 617 or something um, words. Does your child say this word spontaneously? And they have to tick, tick them all, all the ones that um, their child says and then compared them with the children born full term. So the ones on the, um, on the right there are, are the um, children born full term and at 40 weeks. So this, along the bottom here, this is gestation. So 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 weeks. No one born at 45 weeks, um, but 40, 41. Um, and so here are the children really born prematurely. We didn't the gap here is only because we didn't include in the study children born between 35 and 37 weeks um, to make sure that we didn't muddle the two cohorts. Okay, So the full-term cohort was right around 40 weeks and then the PREMS were um, 35 or 33. Yeah, there may be some people missing from that one. But anyway, you can, that's why there's a gap there. The thing to notice is that some of the children born prematurely have larger vocabularies than children born full term. Um, I interviewed a little boy when he was four and he had the most amazing vocabulary. I mean, his maths was rubbish, but his vocabulary was, was incredible. But overall and statistically, the children born prematurely have smaller vocabularies. Um, and that's a worry because we know that um, building up your vocabulary as a young child um, relates to all sorts of other things later, reading ability, so forth. Sorry, you won't be able to read that. That's just far too small. But I tested uh, all 200 children in the study on the self-P, 
that's the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals. Again, it's a, an expressive language um, test. And I'll admit, and I realise I'm doing it to the world because this is being um, recorded, I didn't, I did them all the same, but I didn't actually do them in the pieces of this in exactly the order it said to do them in the manual. And the reason why I didn't is because I knew that these children have attentional difficulties. And in administering this test, you're supposed to do a bit in a flip book, you know how these things go, a bit in a flip book, then have a bit of a discussion about other things, and then a bit more in the flip book. I knew that those transitions were going to be trouble. So I did both the flip book bits one after the other. So this is an improved version if you like, because, because it has taken, uh, just in that little way, has taken out of disaster, in, i.e. depressed scores on the test, uh, something which I didn't think was anything to do with their language abilities, it was to do with their test taking abilities. So I simplified the test taking abilities to get the best response on their language abilities and they are still significantly delayed um, in relation to um, full-term children at four, corrected age. So, to summarize the language summary I'd like to leave you with is that um, smaller vocabularies on average, but great variation between children. The language use, and this is, comes from another part of the um, Maca MacArthur um, CDI, uh, where they're asked to say, parents are asked to say, does your child talk about things that happened in the past, people who aren't here right now, um, possession of objects, abstract concepts, and they did less, they, they, they didn't do as well on those either. Um, they don't, they were delayed in adding EDs and INGs and those sorts of morphology, um, morphological uh, endings. They were delayed in combining words, their syntax is less complex, um, and just to say these effects survived adjusting for certain um, social and emotional things in the, in the family that like mother, maternal education, for example, which even when you adjust for that, these children are still delayed. So in, in early childhood settings, education settings, and into school, you need to be careful. One of the things that people often ask is, okay, so you've been correcting age. So when I say this child is two, I mean they are two gestationally, even if they're two years, three months. But schools don't tend to do that. Schools tend to say, you're five or you're six. In, in New Zealand, I know we're different from you, but in New Zealand, you must go to school by the time you're six, but you can go to school when you're five. In fact, you can go to school the minute you're five. You don't have to wait. <laughs> so, and that's actually culturally what people expect. You know, blow out the candles, put on your backpack, off you go. Uh, and so many of these children really aren't five. The extent to which that needs to be recognised is still not truly known. Some people will say, by the time they're five, it's okay, you can use chronological age. And other people will say, I don't know that you can. The challenge is that all five-year-olds vary. You know, there is, there is variation in the maturity of five-year-olds, whether they were premature or not. And so the people who say, it's fine to use chronological age, are saying, because the PREMs are within that band of variability. That's okay, provided that the type of variability is the same. And I'm not sure that it is. I think some of the PREMs have challenges that you wouldn't see, necessarily, I don't, you know, that isn't purely um, immaturity because of the knock-on impact on the brain of the premature birth. One study showed, uh, within the program that I was involved in, showed that teachers reported that six-year-olds' expressive language was fine of PREMS. I'm actually not convinced. <laughs> As a language person, I'm actually not convinced. I think you get quite a number of PREMS going into school at, at six, or they've been in, in here, they've been in school a year or two. They're motor mouths, but they aren't always actually fully engaged linguistically and the content is not necessarily actually fit for purpose. Um, so I think we have to be careful. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, she's a real talker. Yep, that's fine. Okay, language, all okay. We have to be more subtle than that actually. I think we have to ask, 
How are they using? Are they really understanding what they're saying? Are they really understanding other people? So expressive language by itself isn't necessarily all that we need to look at. We have to look at comprehension. Cognition, um, this is the last bit of, of really looking at the nature of prematurity and its impacts before I talk about our program. This is from the Bailey Scales of Infant Development uh, work in the University of Canterbury project. Just a snapshot, really. At two years, the PREMs were 20%, um, 20% of them were more than six months behind corrected age in cognitive development. 53% um, were average or above compared with 75% in the typical um, population. 47% were actually delayed um, compared to only 25% in the typical population. And of those delays, a small percentage, 7%, had severe delay and 30% had a mild delay. So it does have an impact. And it's an impact that, as educators in particular, we have to pay attention to. Um, at four years, on average, children born preterm are 11 IQ points lower than their full-term comparisons. I'm not saying IQ is a good measure, but it does give you an impression of um, the fragility, really, in all areas of these children. Um, I've sort of covered those things. I think I will. Oh, just one other statistic that I think is, is worth. McCormick, this is not from our study, this is from the literature, but McCormick et al. 2010 suggests that 65% of children born prematurely have some kind of learning disability. It could be in a single area. It could be a particular challenge, um, say, to, to maths, which is the most common, um, or it could be multiple disabilities. Um, but... I think it's worth um, bearing that in mind. And it, the main thing it means for, for educationists is you have to know whether this child was born prematurely. And the trick there is that parents, by the time the child gets to school, many parents are saying, it's behind me. I do not want to deal with this. She's fine. He's fine. Let's not talk about it. We, as educationists, actually have to normalise the question. And... Was your child born prematurely at all? It just has to be part of enrolment. I don't know whether it is here. It might be in some regions and not others. But in New Zealand, we're really trying to get teachers and people who are enrolling children in school, just part of, just one of the questions, you know. It's nothing, nothing special. But once you know it, then it leads you to pay attention to the potential fragilities. So, as I say, maths is, is, is I don't know why, but um, somebody else knows why, let me know. But um, that seems to be one of the really big challenges. So I agree with this quote from one of my colleagues. Early identification and raising awareness amongst educators and schools ought to be a priority alongside developing a better understanding of the risk and protective factors influencing very preterm children's educational achievement. And very preterm here then includes extremely preterm, so any, any preterm. Um, and we really do, we do have to do better, I think. I want to just show you um, a little bit of video before I talk about our program um, of a little boy. This is a little boy, Magnus. Um, you notice the regulatory use of the Play-Doh? Mm. Yeah, he's got a huge lump of pink Play-Doh there and he's using it it's as a means of calming his nervous systems. But... That's, that child's very challenged. Um, it's very hard. So children, when they go to school, who are born prematurely, are not out of the woods. Um, many of them, that awful first few hours, days, weeks that you saw in the first video, are behind them, and they are doing much better. But you've always got to watch for the next phase of development and make sure that that's the case. And we know that those first parent-infant interactions are key to that um, healthy development wherever possible. Not always possible because some of the challenges the children are facing will continue to be challenges. But the best outcomes come when those relationships are in place. So we intervene as soon as the family is able following discharge from hospital. And we track the children's development and their coping strategies together and the coping strategies of the parents 
from a very holistic, ecological, strength-based standpoint throughout early childhood. And if things go pear-shaped um, and the wheels start to fall off at any age, um, which they can, we are there to um, increase the level of service um, to what they, are able, what they need. So um, we... Was that the next one? Sorry, I can't remember whether I've got my slides in the wrong order now. Where am I going? Ah, OK, so from a, um, just from a general point of view, if we're going to get the best outcomes, we need to encourage relationship-based neonatal care. Um, we need to educate allied health practitioners about the short and long-term consequences. We need to educate parents gently about what might happen down the track. Um, that's a tricky one, having hard conversations with parents, particularly when we don't know which way things are going to go. Um, we need to encourage maternal responsiveness and sensitivity and paternal. And we need to engage in sustained, holistic, multidisciplinary assessment without it being intr too intrusive so that we can be sure we know what we're looking at through the whole early childhood period. So I'm just going to, um, this last bit, talk about how we do that. There are other ways, other formats, but at least this will give you an idea of what we do. So we run a program called Assessment and Monitoring uh, that runs in parallel to our early intervention, multidisciplinary early intervention program. So we actually, in Christchurch, we have something which really works well. It's a single point of entry for the whole town. We're a town of about... 350, 400,000. Um, so it's not enormous. We, we're based close to the ocean and we have a large hinterland of, of farmland. So we're not like your urban metropolis here. But um, it does mean we've got some advantages in terms of, of coverage. So what happens is that um, the neonatal paediatrician brings referrals either directly or via their discharge nurse to a fortnightly meeting where those of us who have assessment and monitoring programs can say, yep, we've got a space, or we, um, we can take this child. Two of the NGO, Champion Centre is a, is a non-government organisation. We're an independent trust. We're only partially funded by government, partially funded by private donation. And there are two other um, NGO um, early intervention providers in Christchurch, one of which it, it has a programme like this, and um, is a home-based service. We're a centre-based service, so we ask parents to come to us, but the other programme is home-based. So if we can, we offer the choice to parents, because some parents live rurally and they'd much rather have someone come to them. Other parents also live rurally and want to come to a centre. It's, it's interesting. Some parents like to have someone come to them. Others say, oh, no, I'd have to clean up the house and I can't bother, you know, and I want to meet other parents, so they would come to the centre. So actually the neonatal... Um, staff, both the nursing staff and the um, uh, doctors, are really quite good actually at picking uh, which, one, which children are really going to need full early intervention because they're going to have significant disabilities like cerebral palsy or whatever as a consequence of prematurity and distinguishing those from ones who probably are going to be okay. A lot of experience, they, they are surprisingly good. We do have a number every year who switch from one program to the other. Either they turn out to be worse than we thought or they turn out to be better than we thought. Um, but overall, I would say they probably get it right about 75 to 80% of the time, which is very good. So the program I'm going to talk about today is the Assessment and Monitoring for Prematurity program. So to be accepted into that program, they have to be under... Um, 1,500 grams, that's what that 1,500 is, and or under 30 weeks gestation with a high risk of developmental delay. As opposed to the children going into the full early intervention program um, who obviously already have an identified disability. So I did these numbers just shortly before coming away. We had 78 infants and young children between birth and, and actually I should say between birth and four because that's the last time we see them um, in the program, of which um, 22 were born in the 24 to 28 week um, group, uh, 51 were in the 28 to 31 weeks and five were in the late, um, 
later group. Just to give you an idea of the sort of the size of the babies in the um, in the program. So we've actually got in the whole program at the Champion Centre um, 78 PRIMs, but in the assessment and monitoring program we've got 35. What happens is that they come usually to us at probably something like they're often in in NICU for um, anywhere from two months to nine, ten months, but we'll get them as soon as they are able to, to come to us. And when they first come, the little ones um, will come to us once uh, for an hour to the centre until the, once a week until they're four months corrected. So, and that then at that point, if things are working quite well, then they'll go on to a rotation of um, eight, twelve, 24, 36 months, and if at any point then things look really ropey, then we can change the level of service. So what happens when they come in is, I actually have a picture, I think. When they come in, this is a child who's obviously, I think this is the four-year-old one, might be the three, two and a half, but I think he's probably older. So they'll come into the centre. This is a speech therapist. This is mum in the middle, and this is a psychologist on the left. They come into the centre and they will have a multidisciplinary, um, this is when they're older, they have a multidisciplinary assessment. Um, cognition, language, um, physical, there'll be an OT or a physio involved in the team. Just trying to build up um, a sense of, of, of their development. And if, we, as I say, if we need to um, increase the level of service then we can do it. And it's all done in a play-based kind of way in comfy chairs and um, fun things for the kids to do and um, making it as low stress as possible. Well, I have to say it, it seems low stress to us but we know, we know that the parents don't feel that way. Even when they know the child is doing really quite well it's still quite a high stakes um, event to come to a centre and have your child be observed and do tasks and, you know, you're always sitting there thinking, oh, what if he doesn't beho behave the way that I know he can? Um, it's scary. Um, and it brings back a lot of memories for parents in that environment of their child being tested all the way along, all the way, along the way. So it is a high stakes um, environment. Our team, as I say, has a physio or an OT, a speech therapist and a social worker. Um, or what for us is called a kai which is a Māori support worker, um, but it could be any kind of cultural support worker that's appropriate for the family. Um, as I say, if they're developing um, well, age appropriately, then they go, when, once they're four years, uh, sorry, four months corrected, they will go on to this um, slower rotation, and th they will stay on our roll till they actually go to school. But if things are looking okay, then if um, at four. We will, we will basically do a discharge report. Um, we have got a couple of little booklets, actually, which I, I'll give one copy of each to Carolyn that we've, we've just made ourselves. Um, I might see if I can quickly get it out of my bag. Um, which we have found very useful to just um, encourage parents to learn a little bit about prematurity. They're very low-tech. Low we've just done them ourselves. They've just got a summary of the research. And one is for um, the, which one am I looking at, the infant level, and one is the three to five-year-olds with more of a focus on what the school um, can expect and how parents can help teachers understand what, um, what they might expect from the child. So if they do need more support, then the fuller program would be a, a full team with a speech therapist and early intervention teacher, a physio or an OT, an early childhood educator, a music person, a computer-supported learning person, and a family support team. So what happens typically in the Champion Centre is, I wasn't going to talk too much about this, but um, groups of families come together with always a one-to-one -one relationship between the number of specialists and the number of families. So usually, if it's four-year-olds, four to five-year-olds, it'll be six. So there are six stations, and in the course of the morning, each family has one-on-one -on -one with each of those therapists in their team. They'll have a, a group music session, they'll have morning tea, and they'll have um, uh, 
an opportunity then to, to engage with each other. And then when they go home, the, the specialist team meets together and talks about each of the children and makes sure that all the goals uh, are on track and shares any information needed to make sure that the program is working well. But the children on the assessment and monitoring program, as I say, they have a, a multidisciplinary assessment, but um, and then they will that a, a very brief report on that will go back to the pediatrician um, and to the GP. And uh, if there are any parenting support ideas that need to be given, like particular things they might notice that the family could do to support the child, then they will um, give the parent support. They may do follow-up visits. They may go to home visits. Um, and um, making sure that the parent feels confident to move through the next um, period before. But it's very much about keeping in relationship with this family for the five years. This is the little girl I mentioned and whose mother sent me this email. She's doing amazingly well at school, reaching all her school expectations. Her health is great. She's participating in netball, ballet and swimming at local clubs, very social among her peers. She was 23 weeks, this one. I think the only thing we notice is that she can get very cold, particularly in the school pool. She's the only child who wears a wetsuit. Hopefully there won't be too many surprises around the corner, but I'm sure we and Jess will work through them if and when they arise. That's the kind of resilience we want in families. And that's something that we actively work to try to ensure at the centre. So they have different assessment schedules. I can see you beginning to get twitchy, so I'll try and move a little bit faster. We're, I'm almost done. This, you can get this when we um, share the slides. There's a whole list of parent reports that we, that we use and observational tools that we use. What we use is not so important as the fact that we try to build up a holistic picture of the... Um, of the child's development. Um, and all of the visits happen, we, we prepare the children when they first come into our program, we prepare them as carefully as we can with a home visit from a, a, either a social worker or a family support worker. And making sure, one of the things we always try to make sure is that the parents don't have to tell their story multiple times. They have to tell it once and then we remember it. And so we do everything we can because that's the hardest thing. If you've had to tell your story and it was, you re-traumatize yourself if you don't. So I've talked about that. Um, we get three-person assessment in a warm, welcoming room. We have the parents there, um, sometimes the grandparents. Um, and we make sure that we get an overall um, impression. And at the end of the visit, the family's given a brief overview and then we give them a, a written report. We also, as I say, send um, the report to the paediatrician. Um, if there's a, a social worker, case worker, if this is a child in care, for example, or in um, support from social services, then they will also get one. And we keep in contact with the families between visits. Um, in New Zealand, the word whānau is very important. This is an extended family, basically, but it's, it's as important to Māori children as, um, as their biological parents. There are often, and you'll, you'll recognize this, with children who are fragile for whatever reason, there are often multiple people involved. And we, man we try to keep the coordination between those so that we're, the family is not responsible for joining up these various um, people in this child's um, support team, because that's exhausting. So finally, these literally last two slides. A couple of nuggets from our experience over the years working with children prematurely. Um, first one is that the early weekly visits, when they're coming to us before they're four months corrected, allows us to build relationship. So you can imagine this is a tiny little baby. They bring that little baby in. Half the time, baby's asleep. But that's when we're forming those relationships with the parent, talking about their aspirations. What do they want for their child? What do they remember? What, what, what were the hardest parts? What are the hardest parts now? What are you most worried about? All of those conversations build those first relationships. Um, the first set of visits are frequent enough so that concerns can be allowed to build a bit before taking action. You, what you don't want is visits that are so spaced that if something goes wrong in one visit, you go, Wah! calamity. Because it could be, actually, it was just a bad day. So you need to have multiple visits so you can actually assess just how, how challenged is this child and how, what is this parent actually facing. Um, we follow up non-attenders, and sometimes we take um, the team to the home. 
Um, having a multidisciplinary team is vital. I don't think any one profession can understand prematurity. We need medical input, we need health um, education input, we need social development input, and um, as I say, the neonatologists are quite good at picking. We need constantly to keep the overall health of these children and the parent, but overall health of the children into account. One of the things that people often forget is just what, a, for example, a major piece of surgery or even just being ill with the flu or something else can do to any child actually, knocks them back, can knock them back developmentally for a few weeks. For children who are already fragile, this can have an even greater impact. Nutrition is really important, sleep is really important, and all of those things can be destabilized by prematurity. So it's, it's really important to look at the whole family in context. I mentioned there twins separated in daycare because of dif different developmental levels, something we met last month. A pair of twins in New Zealand in an early childhood centre you have under twos and over twos. I don't know whether you have the same in the UK. The teachers wanted to move one twin up into the over twos because they were doing things that were more advanced and leave the other twin in the under twos. This didn't work for that pair of twins, it didn't work for that mother because they were meeting at different times of the day and there were different activities and then it was a, what did they do? Well, we met with them, we asked the parents what they thought they wanted to do and in the end they moved early childhood centres. But that's the kind of thing you don't even think about if you're actually not working directly with the families. Um, I've mentioned earlier, Willie Pass, that feeling of anxiety, even when they know that this is a, a positive thing to come and visit with us. Transition to school is really tough for many of these parents. Um, and often the children who are born prematurely, but they haven't got cerebral palsy and they haven't got anything else more severe, they won't qualify for any education support. And yet they're carrying the things that I've talked about today. And so that's really challenging. Um, and as I said, I've also said the last point, parents may want to put the whole rough start in life behind them. But if teachers understand the implications of prematurity and are able to teach them well, then they can be part of the variety in an early ch in a educational setting like everybody else. That's me. Thank you for your patience. there to take away isn't there I'm sure you'll agree that that's just um, so so valuable I know that some of you will have burning questions can you just hold on to them just for three or four minutes while I um, welcome Meryl Harvey our reader in nursing just to come and say a few words about some research that she's been undertaking um, in in the area of um, prematurity and while she's loading that up I just want to also tell you that Meryl and I have, it's down here Meryl, <laughs> um, have just been given a, a very small pot of internal funding to, to um, look at the early care and education of children born prematurely, um, which I'm very pleased to say, and I hope she's here, Mihaly Patel from Blitz, you're here, can you, hello, um, uh, Blitz are going to help us and promote that um, survey, they're going to uh, place it on their website. So. If you're a parent or you know parents um, that are, have children born prematurely, please um, encourage them to A, go to that website for support and advice, and B, to participate in our survey when we get it launched later this year. Um, so be thinking about your questions for Susan. I'm sure you've got lots. I can't find it, so I'll just talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, in some ways, it's, it's really a situation of watch this space um, um, and Carolyn just asked me to speak for a couple of minutes about a study that I've been involved in it's called the E-Prime study and having worked on it for five years I still can't remember the acronym what that stands for which is why I wanted the slide um, but basically uh, it's a study that NIH are funded conducted from originally Imperial College in London then transferred part way through to King's College and it's a programme of work looking at uh, comparing the use of MRI and ultrasound in terms of predicting long-term outcomes for, for babies born preterm. The convention in the UK is to use ultrasound scans. Um, 
And there were 511 babies, and they were followed up for two years. Um, and it's an NIHR-funded study, uh, and the report is currently with the reviewers. So the findings are actually embargoed at the moment anyway. Um, so it was really just kind of to put it on your radar to look out for it. Um, hopefully it will be out soon. One of the things that we did was a scoping exercise um, looking at how many neonatal units in the UK have access to an MRI scanner because if the findings demonstrate that they are more effective <coughs> excuse me, in terms of predicting long-term outcomes, then there might be issues there. So we were looking at whether neonatal units had an MRI scanner within the unit, within the building that the, the um, neonatal units placed, within the hospital setting or whether they would have to send out their babies elsewhere. I can't share findings, but you won't be surprised to know that there are very few neonatal units that have an MRI scanner within the neonatal unit. So um, if the findings suggest that the MRI is better at predicting long-term outcomes, then there will be um, implications there. Um, the, the hypothesis of the study is that the MRI will be more effective in terms of predicting long-term outcomes, but one of the things that was built in within the study is not only the long-term follow-up of the child, and they were reassessed at two years to see how um, that assessment matched with those uh, initial scan results, but also the impact on parents of having that more detailed information in terms of predicting perhaps more likely severity because, again, as Susan has alluded to, there, there would be the instances where the scans were predicting things that actually, in the event, didn't occur. Likewise, there will be children within the study who had, for want of a better word, normal scans who then um, developed uh, problems. The children are actually being followed up beyond two years and the older children now are about five, and they've, they are reassessing uh, those children uh, as we speak. So it was really just kind of to put, to put it on your radar, and obviously um, the findings will be out as and when we can uh, publish them. any buttons to press so so um questions for susan then please i might just follow up on that there's a new article out by sam bora b-o-r-a looking at long term with the cohort that we used and I, I haven't read it yet but i understand it doesn't show terribly good predictability of the early scans to the later scans but <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes. Yes, so we obviously the ones who get referred um, we have a good chance that they will participate, but sometimes um, it can take a while to engage with them. Basically, we work cooperatively with the outreach nurses from the, from the hospital who will quite often hang on to children who, whose parents are not yet ready to engage with us. Um, it is a challenge, and I don't know that I've got any good solution other than putting the focus on the transition of the relationships from one environment to another. So sometimes there will be families where the um, hospital has actually managed to create sometimes tenuous but nonetheless the beginnings of a relationship and we will sometimes go in and join the hospital staff for some engagement in the hospital environment if, they, if the hospital staff feels that if they just discharge them they could just be disappear into the ether and we never see them again. So we will, it's often that handing over process that is, is crucial. And similarly, we do an enormous around, amount, not so much with the children on the assessment and monitoring program, but in general, transitioning into school and making sure that the relationship between the parent and the school personnel 
um, are set up in advance um, because it's yeah there are a lot of, there's a lot of fear there amongst parents I mean I've yet to m meet a parent who doesn't want to do the best for their child but they don't necessarily know how to do that um, and sometimes of course there are practical things that get in the way they haven't got the resources to get somewhere we and and to um, you know to, to, to reach us at the center for example that's where we're lucky that we have the other NGO service that is a home-based service so we will sometimes hand the transfer the, the family, with their permission of course, but to a home based service so that they're actually being visited at home, which again is a way to... But it takes a long time. I mentioned our Kai Whakapuawai, which is our Māori support worker. I have to allow her two to three times the amount of time to engage with the families that are on her caseload than I, generally speaking, need to do for um, families that are, you know, um, white <laughs> middle class parents because you have to do it you, ca you can't rush it um, and so you have to allow the time that is necessary for not just cultural in the, with a big C but cultural with a little C of the family that is involved and if you don't do that you're, ask you're really asking for trouble the other thing to say is that we've um, just now got rolling out in Christchurch something that's very new for us called children's teams. And these are teams that respond to requests for support for children who don't meet the statutory requirement for going into care for abuse or neglect, but who are just below the ones that you're really, really worried about, that if things don't change, that we are, you know, they are children are going to have to be taken into statutory care. And the what, what they're doing now is having a key person who can then bring together all of the other um, specialists that need to be involved. And we're on tap for any of the families that we have engaged with or we've offered a place to, to be called upon by those teams if necessary. So again, there's another um, route. And I think you've been trying to do, in England, you've been trying to do similar sorts of things, trying to join up the services and take the burden of that joining up away from the away from the family and keep the and for us what's huge is an, an agreement to share information I don't know how tricky that is here in England but in New Zealand it's enormous that um, privacy rules outweigh sensible sharing of information we're trying desperately to get over that for us in New Zealand that one of the main reasons is that we have one of the very worst child abuse rates in the OECD. We're, we're about almost at the bottom. There's, we have five million people in New Zealand. Every month, one of them is killed by someone they know, usually someone within their family. I mean, it's, it's horrendous, and we've got to change it in New Zealand. Because, you know, you have an image of New Zealand, a nice, nice green place, gentle place. N not, not in some of the, some of the homes. So. Is that culture-related? Well, I wouldn't want to say that it's culture-related in an, in any obvious way. Um, clearly, it is related to um, challenges of resourcing and education and anger management and so forth. Um, statistically, it does. Uh, well, actually, I'm not even sure I can say that. People will tell you statistically it is, it is more likely to occur in Māori families. But actually, there's a bias in the reporting. And many of the children who are, who are killed by, in other communities doesn't, doesn't get so reported. So there's an expectation in New Zealand that if, if a child has been killed, it's got to be one of those Māori children. Um, but actually, as many, if not more, are damaged or killed within the... Because the Māori population is, is a fraction of the whole population. Yep. So, um, I really wanted to ask about
absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We do. Um, it's not throughout the nation. It depends on the particular area that you live in. Um, but that some version of that um, dyadic work is, is absolutely vital, of course. Yeah. Um, and we, the Champion Centre, we sort of do a kind of a version of, of some of the Weight Watch and Wonder stuff, for example. Um, I've just spent time with Stella Accaroni in London because she does some really, really good work. Um, doesn't have to be done um, psychoanalytically the way she does it, but it's the same, yeah, as long as it's, it's that learning the child and dealing with the trauma, as you say. So it's, it's yeah, it's there. It's not, it's not throughout the, the country, but it's in, in various places. And even at the Champion Centre, at various times, we have had a more psychotherapeutic as opposed to psychological. At the moment, we've got a clinical psychologist, a developmental psychologist, and an educational psychologist, um, all working part-time. Um, but that's not because we don't think psychotherapy is a useful tool. It's just the way it is at the moment. Yeah. Just ask about the children when they do enter school. Yeah. Um, but as you said, that your, your intervention stops when they get to school. Yeah. Children, as you said, mm. very often you know, have challenges yeah. right throughout their lives. That's right. Um, so the Ministry of Education provides um, behaviour support. Um, in a, <laughs> wish you wish it wasn't called that, and it wasn't. Yeah. yeah. Um, it provide if it, yeah. That's probably the most likely for this this group. We have people called RTLBs, Resource Teachers of Learning and Behaviour, who are able to work in classrooms to support. F frankly, well, we're, we're a funny system in New Zealand because all schools are now independent. They are all governed by tr trusts, run by trust boards, and they are funded by the government, but they have control over how they spend their budget. So it's very spotty. Some schools will realise that it's worth investing in um, more for children. They get a special education grant that's designed to cover various bits and pieces, but never enough, of course. And some, some good principals will realise that this is what they need to do, and others, others won't. Um, so unfortunately, what happens is, in some cases, the challenges become escalated because the school's not responding. Um, and in other cases, ch children, you know, are lucky. Some, some parents choose to homeschool for that reason. Yeah. So I'd like to tell you that, it, you know, we've got a lovely, seamless system and, you know, come and visit New Zealand and see exactly how it's done. But actually, no, it's as, it's as challenging for us. Um, and our Ministry of Education, I mean, there's some great people in the Ministry of Education, but they are so crushed by the system and so underfunded that... <laughs> I need to tell you, it's probably <laughs> extremely familiar. So one of the things that we overtly do with our parents at the Champion Centre is build advocates. We tell them, you need to understand, well, we don't put it that way, but we encourage them to understand their child, understand their child's needs, rattle cages like crazy, and don't be told, this, you know, I'm sorry, there's nothing for you. Um, because the more knowledgeable they are, the more powerful they are. And of course, parent voices are much stronger than mine as a service provider. I'm jumping up and down saying, we need more services, we need more money. Um, but it's the parents who will actually embarrass the hell out of the ministers, that's what I say. You know, go to the parliament, rattle the cages, tell them that you'll not vote for them. Sorry, do you want to do it and then you? Yeah. So if, if it is genuine mental health issues that are beyond the expertise within the centre, we will refer out, yeah. Um, we do have a counsellor on tap and we, do, we have engaged psychologists and psychotherapists even occasionally um, f on behalf of families. Again, we have to fund this privately in order to do it um, because we don't charge anything to the centre because that's the way it should be. But um, 
so we do sometimes have to refer out in that way. But I would, I would say that quite often it, it doesn't need to be pathologised, that if you really look at the relationship and really look at what the family needs right now and provide that support over whichever hump it is that we're dealing with at the moment, you can quite often, you know, go a different path. So the advantage of them seeing us so frequently is that you can figure that out. That was one of the points I was trying to make. You know, you don't want to pathologise before that's necessary. On the other hand, you have to be really professionally responsible and not, not refer if that's really... So that's, that's another reason why it's really good to have clinical psychologists on staff who can say, actually, this, this is not going to be good. One of the children that we're presenting on in Sweden did turn out to be that the child's challenges were being reflected through quite complex mental health issues in the parent. Um, the parent was actually a ne ne neonatal nurse. And that was a whole layer of challenge for her because she knew what this could look like. And she didn't, for example, she didn't want her child to be fed through a peg because she was just terrified that this was, you know. So, but we, and in that particular case, actually, we did hire a very skilled, um, I, think she was, I think she was a clinical psychologist, she could have been a psychotherapist. And we actually, it was quite costly, I mean, it was a couple of thousand dollars, which is a lot of money for us, but it made the difference. It turned the corner um, and allowed this, this unit to, to thrive. Um, and sometimes, and I wish we could do it for everyone. But, but we can't. One of the, I was talking to someone earlier, I can't remember if it was Marin or, that we have, um, oh no, it was you, mothers and baby, our mothers and babies unit at the hospital is neither in NICU nor in adult mental health services. It's just in some odd spot in the, in the system and it doesn't make any sense. It needs to be pull, pulled in so that you're um, dealing with both. Yeah. You. I don't think there is. I, in the literature, you can find people who say there is. But I think we've got serious challenges in recognising what's autism and what is what, is, what Stella calls pre-autism, pre-autistic behaviours. Because the things that you see in young children are largely the result of their sensory systems and their inability to manage their sensory systems in a world that is overwhelming. Their regulation and and because their sensory systems are so primed to go off, as it were, in terms of touch, in terms of smell, sight, sound, or the whole lot, um, that there's the anxiety is probably the number one thing. And so, in this is a different part of our program. In our relating and communicating program, that's what we deal with first. We try to figure out what is it that makes this child anxious because if you can manage that then you get a regulated child and it's it's activities that will calm them down but it's also the way the parents are responding to the child so you don't actually know what you're looking at until you manage that level of that anxiety in both parent and child yeah so in the, in the study at the University of Canterbury, because when we put the um, measures in place, people were saying, oh, autism is more common, I actually recommended that we collect at the same time at the, at the four-year-old um, data stage, we use the communication checklist, which has got the child, children's communication checklist, which has got a number of questions that are designed to give you fair warning if, if there is autism, if it looks like autism. autism. And we didn't find anything. We haven't published that data. But I, th I think, and this is what the presentation in Sweden is about, is that it, 
yes, it can look like that. They're not meeting your eye, they're bouncing off the walls, all of these things that you would say, well, this looks like autistic behaviour, but actually it's not. And I'm not saying that, uh, then it opens the whole can of worms about is a diagnosis useful or not useful or what does it open in terms of services, all of that stuff. But I think if we can listen more carefully to what the child's presentation is telling us, we can hear some things that mean we can change destinies, to use the title of Stella's new book, because you can actually go down. The thing is that we're dealing here with brains that are still able to change. And autism isn't fixed. And when it's very young, you can get quite different outcomes. Um, and we have to get past the notion that, oh, my child has been diagnosed as autistic, so they are autistic forever. Um, because they, that might not be helpful. And for a start, it's a spectrum, and many people on the spectrum are quite capable of contributing to life. In fact, we owe the internet to people on the spectrum, and we know, uh, no, owe an enormous amount. So we have to... That's not to say that there aren't children who find it really hard to live in the world that we've created for them. Um, but we can do a lot better and make a world that's easier for them and easier for us if we work together. Yeah. as early as possible, but um, one of the things in the British sort of state education system that I've encountered as a parent is that the teachers and the head will just say, oh, she'll catch up, don't worry, she'll catch up. And when they don't meet those criteria for special needs or any additional support, yeah. the view tends to be, oh, don't worry, they'll catch up. Yeah. And I know that there's an issue, yes. that they should have extra support. Yeah. Um, and it's only seems to be now my daughter's older that the teachers go, oh, yeah, I see what you mean, actually. There is, a, as maths gets harder and harder, yeah. and she still can't do it, yeah. there's much a much bigger gap. Whereas if they're four or five, yes. they just say, oh, don't worry, she I know. It. So I'm just wondering if there's any research that is, would be helpful or on the older child, the sort of, you know, 10 and as they yeah. go through puberty, that would be interesting. Um, there is. And it's a similar picture to what I've painted already, which is some do, some don't. But there is, um, there is quite a lot of literature now on, on teens. Some of it we have to manage carefully because you have to ask what was the, what was the neonatal, what was the early yeah. stuff that happened then, um, you know, because procedures have changed. But... Um, there's quite a lot of literature on, on teens, on adolescents, and on, and on adults. Um, some of it's a bit scary um, because some of the proportions of, of adult mental health among children born prematurely are... There's a Swedish cohort, for example, that's, you know, not what we would, what we would want. So, again, some will catch up, some won't. Um, but you can't take that chance. Well, like you say, you know, you've got to you've got to assume that they're not going to, and provide the support so that if they do, great. Well, my, my attitude was, why should they have to catch up? Their, if if their brain is developing at a different pace, mm. because they had a bleed or a collapsed mm. lung or whatever, why should they have to catch up? You should be seeing them at the corrected age throughout, and also taking into account where they were at at full mm. term. So I would say to a teacher, at 40 weeks, she was yeah. still three pounds. Yeah. So you can't compare uh, her at 40 weeks to yeah. a full term. Yeah, that would be that's my right. My yeah, view that's what is I was. let's look at how yeah. old she was, which was eight pounds, yeah. the equivalent of yeah. a full term. In yeah. case she was six months old. Yeah. So then let's compare her, let's take six months off her right. age and compare her there. Yeah. Because unfortunately the education system is ticketing to the level. Oh, I know. Yeah, absolutely, and heard okay, by... Well, she's doing quite well, but it's very difficult not to be accused of being a pushy parent yeah. if you're trying to get her needs yeah. met. Um, but the research is always helpful. Absolutely. So the issue of correction is still a bit murky at those older ages. I, I actually think that, in a sense, pr the prematurity is, is not the issue anymore. 
the, the question is, have you got a child who needs additional support for whatever reason to meet their full potential? And premature, it might be prematurity, it might be something else. I mean, it might have been some childhood illness that is, you know, whatever. It, you know, it could be anything. Um, I, my, my beef is with education systems, and you're in one and I'm in one, that herds children by chronological age as opposed by developmental age. We know what developmental age looks like. Why do we keep pushing children through this sausage machine just because they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? And we've just got recently 2010 national standards. Ugh. Um, it's not right. It's, it's not right for any, for any child. I think you're probably on less secure ground trying to say, I'm still correcting for the prematurity when she's 12 or whatever she is, um, than saying, this is the pathway we've taken. This is how far we've got along it. We need some more support to get her um, where she is able to go with support and scaffold her into the next stage. Um, and, and that would be, and be as pushy as you like. That's what I reckon. 